Hey everyone, meet Master Ip, named by my kids. He is a rescue bearded dragon that we got from the Humane Society. We got him not knowing anything about bearded dragons. We got him in a very neglectfully small, like, terrarium. It was not adequate for a lizard this size or even adequate for a juvenile like, like a newborn. So, as we did more research, we, the more and more terrified we were. We went to PetSmart to look at their options, but for the money they're asking for, we could just do something ourselves. The biggest one we could find at PetSmart was 40 gallon, not near big enough. So, like any person who likes DIY projects, we went to Lowe's, picked up some things, we assembled it all together. This video is showcasing how we sought out to make the best reptile enclosure for our bearded dragon here. Stay tuned and check out the whole thing. So for starters, I went to the Lowe's craft wood section and just bought a bunch of random wood I thought would work. And then I got some glass cut there. Apparently you can get glass cut there for fairly cheap in any size you want it. These were three sheets of this. This was solid wood, not plywood. Um, they was about 16 inches tall, about three quarter inch thick. And one of them was substantially longer than the other two. That way we could make the sides off of the end cuts. We cut this just under five feet. In fact, this longer one here that we cut actually ends up making the sides once we cut it in half. We place the middle piece on top and underneath the two other pieces. That way we can get the full strength of wood. We ran a 1 8 inch pilot hole and then we just ran just drywall screws. Didn't get anything terribly fancy. We could have got like coated deck screws that were painted the color of wood and that probably would have saved us a little bit of extra agony later on, but we also get around that. We also use wood glue in between all pieces that we screw together to substantially strengthen this thing. Now to mount the top piece in the exact same way we mounted everything else. On top with glue seamed in everywhere. And then we ran all the other end of cuts to the front where we needed like a spacer for all the framing to mount on and for the door to mount on. We're going to run a big long window and then a short little door to kind of have access to must have essential things. And then we're gonna have a top hatch that's uh, gonna sit on a spring prop. We have some cool things coming up. I got around having bigger, more substantial tools like a miter saw with that little five and a half inch circular saw and a few sanding apparatus. I use an orbital sander, a belt sander, which really, really works substantially well in leveling out stuff that didn't come out quite even. And then running wood glue everywhere and then eventually using plastic wood to have fillers. We'll get to that a little bit later. But now let's put in the framing. To mount that frame on, here's where we mount those pieces of wood that we cut up earlier to make the box. We get to use a little bit more of that in here to make spacers for the face frame to main on on. And then later on, once we have the face frame mounted, we're going to frame in the glass. I haven't done any of these things before. I've never had to cut glass or mount glass in anything. And I'm generally working with metal and other materials over wood. So if I can do this, anybody can. So that mod was fairly simple to make, very easy to install and strengthen up the entire box. And now we have spots where we can actually mount the face frame. I've never mounted glass before. I was researching some of the more popular videos on YouTube. It was just a bunch of people talking. What is it with you DIY tubers and talking too much? Later on in the sunlight, I realized that those black screws look pretty ugly. So I ended up pulling a lot of them out and then using a countersink bit to give the screws a little bit of an indent. And then we're gonna put plastic wood over all those screw heads and then sand them down. So this whole thing can actually look really well later on when we seal it in. A miter saw would have made this framing process a lot easier, but I hate miter saws. They take up too much room in my garage, so I refuse to get one. But if you have one, they're awesome. So I countersunk all those holes so I could do this. This is plastic wood. I'm clearly not a woodworker, but I will tell you, you get this plastic wood and you put it in all your imperfections and on all the seams and all the covers, it makes you look like you're a professional woodworker. This actually came out really nice after we hit it with an orbital sander. A palm center will work as well. We did this throughout the entire project. 
Now, something I'm a little bit more comfortable with is framing in stuff. So I never have framed in glass. It doesn't look terribly hard. I tried to follow some of the videos on YouTube. Some of these people have the personality of a cardboard box. I couldn't watch their videos. I gave up. And I'm just gonna do this myself. Seems like all you really need is some sort of backing and then something to hold in the glass. And then some sort of silicone or equivalent to kind of seal the glass. So that's pretty much what we're gonna do. We measured it so the glass would fit right directly in here, but then somewhere down the line, like most things I try to do with my head and no schematics, I screwed it up. So I had to go to the hardware store and then get a glass cutter. So I'm not inherently thrilled about having to cut this glass. I've never cut glass before, but like anything involving a project like this, I researched it on YouTube and then found out cutting glass is actually fairly easy. You should get a little four or five dollar glass cutter like this, find a video where the person doesn't talk too much, watch the video, and then it was pretty free. it was pretty simple. I may have even overcomplicated it here, where it really just is snap off when you cut a clean line, you etch a clean line in with that little roller. Now we have a perfect fit. Yes! <laughs> I was gonna just use silicone to kind of seal in and you know actually have a secondary adhesive, but I found this stuff called Lexel, and it is really tacky, and it dries completely clear. It's like silicone without all the flaws. I totally dug it. I used painter tape over the glass just to make sure that the adhesive wasn't going to smear all over it during the application, and then I had this half-inch aluminum angle, 1 16th inch thick. I bought this at a local metal shop, but you can also find this at the end of the hardware section at a Lowe's or a, really any hardware store has little architectural small pieces of aluminum like this that are really, really useful. We just use that to seat the rest of the frame in there. So remember the backing we stuck on the other side of the frame in the back, that is one inch, I'm sorry, that's like one inch by one sixteenth inch flat bar. And then this is angle that sits right inside the frame. So that in conjunction with the countersink screws that we stuck here gave it a pretty nice aesthetic look. I dug it. Not my best aluminum work, but for this, I thought it actually looked pretty good. It kind of gave it this odd look. I cut and slotted brackets out of a random piece of scrap metal. Just cut it with a bandsaw and a square. So leave out any squares in there and that'll be what the glass sits against. We'll rim it on the inside with half inch angle, just like we did the other one. We're gonna kinda just, these will be temporary staples, just to get it going. And we'll put some deeper ones in the back. This one point in time made me really kinda regret not getting a Craig joiner to make that little pocket hole where it holds the frame in perfect. But we end up getting around it. We end up drilling pocket holes and pilot holding it very, very, just pretty much like this. We got some deeper self-tapping, like more more durable screws that we get into kind of holding the end, all ends together. We only had to staple that one area because I just needed something solid to hold the whole thing straight. And then just like everything else, we put plastic wood over all the imperfections, including the staple holes once we pull the staples out. And that looked pretty good. The whole thing, pretty simple. You see the little ends in there where the glass gets held in. Now we have to cut this piece of glass because we had to cut the other piece of glass because once your one measurement's off, all measurements are off. But what I learned from the other piece is for one, I mean, the glass, when I gave it a nice whip smack, it broke way clearer than when I was trying to use that little, that tapping ball on the end of that glass tool. That framed in good. We kind of, that went a lot easier because we did the first one. But this side door is really just a quick access so we can quickly access things, but we really need to make a main door, like a top one. That's what this one's for. This is gonna be the main access to the entire enclosure. We stuck one by two studs underneath all corners of the drop-in, and that is what the hatch will sit on. We did it in much the same way that we did the rest of the box with wood glue, and then countersinking the holes piloting the holes and then just putting a bunch of screws in.
So this lid, after being glued and screwed in and cured, pretty strong. This will hold the entire hatch, which is good because this wood is not light. We're just using some standard hinges that we found at the hardware store. Just some basic ones in four spots, and that will be all you need to hold the entire door. We also got some cheap but good looking handles. They had a million little handles I guess they had for shelves and drawers and cupboards. So that was like pretty easy. There was like an abundance. I plastic wooded the rest of this stuff. Like an orbital sander or a palm sander would do just fine. And we're gonna go ahead. Okay, so I wanna vent on each side of this area i looked at all the like like area vents like for houses i've seen people use those i don't think they like do the best job these are actually like sink drains or just drains you put over that will be fine and the holes are small enough to where crickets can't crawl out and really nothing can get in so we're gonna get a hole saw and do this This is a Reptisun T8. I think they wanted the T10 was recommended, especially, but this is all the PetSmart had. If we had to upgrade it later, we have to upgrade. This thing was friggin' expensive though, by itself. The bulbs, did not come with a bulb. The bulb was an extra like X amount of dollars. So you plan on spending like a friggin' hundred and something dollars for just this. Here, we're gonna run the UVA and the basking bulb. Literally, it'll be like right here. So because I'm running a solid wood top and not a screen top, I'm going to go ahead and etch in with a router spots where the lights can just kind of sit in and stay there. And then we'll find some other obscure way to secure them once they're on top. I think with that one we're cutting out right now, we can have that one pressure fit in there. And with the other one, we can just have a very, very loose tire over the top. And both of those will hold in place when we open and close the lid. The lid will have a gas spring prop at the end that allows it to be held up without any sort of assistance. So we don't have to worry about it slumming on our hands or slumming on the lizard itself, which is, you know, a bad day for both of us. If you're wondering about whether or not this setup overheated and potentially caused the wood to catch on fire, with a 150 watt bulb, it got really hot. It didn't catch the wood on fire, but it was a little sketch. So we ran 100 watt in below for that side and we don't have to worry about it. And the other one, the UVB long light, that doesn't generate really any heat at all. Between the UVB and the UVA and the basking bulb, he has more or less all the light he's going to need, and he's going to have in certain sections so he can migrate from one side of the tank to the other when he needs to. Now we have to cut out the vents. The side vents are not going to be enough. I already tried to cut them down if you're looking at those odd lines right there. That's where I tried to cut them out, but then I forgot I had the tank upside down. So then I had to like not cut those out and then seal the wood glue in there. It's forever going to look stupid on the bottom, but at least we didn't cut them out completely. That would have been terrible, right? We can cut these out completely though, and they'll look sweet. We're going to use this Minwax Polyacrylic Protective Finish. Clear, semi-gloss, so it can be wiped up if something's on it, but it's not too shiny. So this stuff is just going to give it a semi-gloss and seal the wood very well so any sort of mess inside the tank won't seep into the wood and cause any residual rot or stinkage or contamination. Now for the vents, very, very simple. We just use three little tapered screws on each corner and these actually look pretty sweet, especially when the tanks light up. Um, you'll see here in a little bit. I kind of wish I would have just ran these in the back as well but it's too late, we're committed. We're gonna run these, which came out pretty nice, on the sides, and then we're gonna run these vents in the very back, which is gonna give a pretty copious amount of ventilation throughout the entire tank. And now we're gonna move on to the substrate. I was gonna get this, this like linoleum tile stuff with a little bit of texture so it wouldn't slip. I still may do that, it's better than actual tile. This is not adhesive shelf liner with kind of like a grippy stuff. And this is still like solid, you can wipe it clean. 
So I watched a few hours of people talking about Substrate for Bearded Dragons, and really, I thought the best idea here, until I find a more permanent solution, was this non-adhesive shelf liner. Reason being, it's solid, it's not hard, it has grip, the lizard won't like slip on it, it's, it's, you know, not hard on the bones, it's, it's, I mean, it's rubbery for heck's sake. And you can wipe up and clean up mess very, very easily on it. And if it, there's so much mess on of it, you can just take it out and wash it off. And after, I will tell you right now, after using it for a while in the tank, it's very awesome. The only bad thing is you can't find a really good looking texture to it. It's actually, all the designs they had are kind of ugly. This was like the best looking one. That's what it's, that's what the stuff is. But it was like nine bucks a roll. Unbeatable for the cost, especially because we need one now. Because our Bitter Dragon is a neglectfully small tank. That's what we got um, from the Humane Society owner. And yeah, we just need to get this thing going now. After watching all the videos about how you should take care of your dragon, I'm absolutely horrified that it's been living in that tank that long. So we're just trying to get this thing done in as fast as we possibly can. We're already like a day behind, which is annoying. The last thing we did was put a latch here. Nothing fancy. Just need to hold the door closed and while we go in and out of accessing it. Cleaned it up, got it ready to be prepped, ready to drop in here, and ready for action. We're gonna see how Master Ip likes it. All right, here goes nothing. So he literally has about three to four times as much space as he had. And so he might have been initially freaked out a little by that, and then he quickly forgot about that and realized, well, that he was hungry. Overall, after continuous use of the tank, he seems to be much happier. He can actually go and eat. Then he'll go and heat himself up on top of that rock underneath the basking bulb. And then he'll go to the other side of the tank and chill on one of the logs, and then he'll just move around wherever he wants. The vents on the side work fantastic. I got those because they're too small for any crickets or anything to crawl out of. The back vents, on the other hand, the crickets can crawl out of them, so I gotta fix that. We are able to monitor the entire temperature of the tank. Um, we have some in the middle, and then we have some installed there on the side for both humidity and temperature. Our lights give him everything he needs and we can switch them on and off as needed to control temperature in the cage. And he really likes these logs, so we'll have to get him some more. And we're gonna move on and do more things, but this is a good start. At night, he really likes to sleep in there or he likes to sleep on the very, very top. Just depends on his preference. The tank fluctuates generally. He likes not like it much hotter than 89, 90 degrees. Like when it's over 90 degrees, you see him always constantly on that side, like abating the heat. So. I know like people have recommended it to be like somewhere toward a hundred. I think it's a little little too hot for him. He doesn't like it specifically. We have the digital thermometers and we have another digital thermometer and a hydrometer over on this side. And we have an analog one thermometer and hydrometer right there smack in the middle. So between like we have sensors all around the tank to give us a variation. You can see the definite drop offs. So the analog, despite people saying they're inaccurate, that one is fairly accurate and consistent with the fluctuation between this side and that side. You might get an additional hydrometer. So that's it that. for this project. Sometimes you just need to take a break from like the other stuff and just do a little simple one. That was definitely off the norm for what we usually do on this channel, just an offhand project. But I hope it's useful to you or maybe to somebody else you know. Thank you very much. See you.